This is a case of the week presentation presented by Bird Ultrasound. If you'd like to enjoy more educational material available at Bird Ultrasound, please visit birdultrasound.com.au. Welcome to Bird Ultrasound Case of the Week. This week we're going to consider supraspinatus atrophy. When I examine the rotator cuff, I not only look at the tendons and the anthesis wherever I can, but I also like to assess the muscle bellies. So in the rotator cuff, I can assess the muscle bellies of the long and the short head of, of the biceps apparatus. I can also assess the muscle belly of supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor. So it's really only subscapularis that is hidden from my vision, and that's because it's tucked between the scapula and the chest wall. So as I go through my routine shoulder rotator cuff assessment, I will take images of all of the other muscle bellies, and it's quite straightforward to work out if these muscle bellies have atrophy change. If a muscle is healthy, it's black on ultrasound, so quite hypoechoic, and it is bulky and large. And when the patient does a provocative manoeuvre to activate the muscle, you'll see it twitch and, and activate really quickly and easily. When a muscle has atrophy, the overall size of the muscle reduces significantly, and, and it usually does this in a quite a global symmetrical way. And the muscle becomes a lot more echogenic. So when you see an echogenic small muscle, you think immediately that this is atrophy change. And it may be because the tendon's torn, it may be because it's been deneuralized, it may be because it's suffering from disuse. Uh, but nonetheless, it has atrophy change. Now the supraspinatus tendon though is a little bit unique. It has a special way of atrophying. Uh, nearly all muscles atrophy in a symmetrical way, but the supraspinatus does not atrophy in a, in a symmetrical way, and it's really important that you understand what the pattern of atrophy is. And I'm going to explain this to you. So this is the typical picture that I would take to document the muscle belly health of supraspinatus when I do a, a routine shoulder ultrasound. The transducer here is just placed absolutely parallel to the, to the plane of the scapula, and it's just slightly anterior to the spine of the scapula. So in other words, it's exactly the same picture as I'm going to use to document the suprascapular notch. So anatomically, what we have is we have the trapezius muscle, the supraspinatus tendon in the middle. This is all supraspinatus muscle. This is the, the scapula. This is the suprascapular notch. This is the lateral edge of the glenoid. And just off the edge of the screen here, this is the superior labrum. So this image for me has quite a bit of value and it's worth documenting. I can see there's no paralabral cyst arising from a labral tear. I can see that there's no paralabral cyst invading and displacing the suprascapular nerve from its notch. Remember that the suprascapular nerve is the motor driver for the supraspinatus muscle and also the infraspinatus muscle. So if it's damaged, you'll have dual atrophy of both of those muscle bellies. And the other really important of information uh, from this image is that I can say that there's no significant atrophy change of this supraspinatus muscle belly. So this is a really valuable picture for me. If we go through the anatomy, this is the trapezius muscle and this is the supraspinatus tendon sitting right in the middle of its muscle belly. Now deep to the supraspinatus tendon, this is supraspinatus muscle and superficial to it, this is also supraspinatus muscle. Now that leaves this little triangle of tissue here, this small triangle, and this triangle of tissue is actually just adipose. This is just some fatty tissue that sits in this location. And this is what we're going to see every time we see a healthy supraspinatus muscle belly. So in real time, this is what I see. I can see the notch, I can see the, the edge of the labrum, I can see the, the tendon in the middle of the muscle belly, and I can see a thin slither of fat sitting between the trapezius and the superficial surface of supraspinatus. Here's another case here, and then of course we can also swing 90 degrees as I have now, and you can also do the same assessment in the short axis. So when you're in the short axis, you've got the tenon in the middle, and there it is in long axis. Swing into short axis, tenon in the middle, muscle on top and below. There's the thin layer of adipose, and this is trapezius over the top. So you can do it in short or long axis. I tend to use the long axis picture like it is there, as I feel like this just gives me a really nice dual purpose image where I can see the notch, I can see the labrum, and I can assess for, a, for a, a muscle atrophy all in the one image. So if that's what a healthy one looks like, what's this one? On first, first glance, you might think it looks exactly the same as the last one. You're seeing some skin, some fat, some trapezius muscle, uh, the supraspinatus tendon sitting here, and you've got nice muscle underneath it, and you've got nice muscle on top of it. And you think to yourself, this looks pretty good. 
However, on a more careful assessment, you might notice that this muscle here is a little bit more echogenic than it should be. So you can start to see a lot more of the of the fascial septi, if you like, in the muscle and a, a lot less of the hypoechoic uh, area, which is the healthy muscle fibre. But there's one other change that's really important, and it can be quite subtle and uh, and difficult to pick up on. Let me run you through it. So here's the trapezius muscle over the top, and there's the supraspinatus tendon there. And underneath supraspinatus, this is in fact supraspinatus muscle belly sitting underneath the tendon. Now, that leaves this triangle of tissue here, which initially, at first instance, you might have thought that this was muscle belly. However, this is actually a triangle of fat. So this is the same as in the healthy patient, but you can see how this fat has become quite a large area of fat. So what's happened here is that the tendon has now become the superficial surface of the muscle. So the muscle underneath it has a relative um, you know, minor degree of atrophy change, but the muscle component on top has completely disappeared, leaving only adipose tissue to fill that space. So this is a significant atrophy change of the supraspinatus muscle belly. So if you look at this patient again, this is a different patient, and let's go through the same analytical process. So there's the trapezius muscle on the top, there's the supraspinatus tendon sitting in, in the centre of the, of the muscle. However, there's the muscle underneath the tendon, this is the muscle on top of the tendon, and you can see a real asymmetry here, and you can see that the way that the muscle superficial to the tendon has become very thin and uh, almost non-existent, and then again, this opportunistic triangle of fat has filled up this space. So this bit of tissue here is, is not muscle. This is a triangle of fat, this is muscle, this is muscle, and because the tendon has floated, if you like, to the surface of the muscle, almost like a cork floating to the surface of a bucket of water, uh, this means that we have significant atrophy change here that should be reported. So in real time, this is what you see in a patient that has atrophy change. You can see we've got trapezius on the top, we've got the supraspinatus tendon here, we've got a bit of muscle underneath. You've virtually got no muscle on top of that tendon though, and a triangle of fat. So this patient has significant atrophy change. And this will make a real difference to their management. So if they're considering having a surgical repair, the fact that they've lost so much bulk from their supraspinatus muscle belly and the remaining component still has a bit of increased echogenicity may mean that they're not as suitable for a, a surgical intervention. Here's another nice example where you can see the tendon and on top of the tendon, you can see there's virtually no muscle whatsoever and there it is in the short axis as well. You can see that the only thing superficial to the supraspinatus tendon here is that triangle of fat and a very, very wafer thin layer of muscle. So significant atrophy once again. So in the short axis, this is what the anatomy looks like. In the, uh, in the superficial layer, of course, we've got the trapezius and then in the center of the supraspinatus muscle belly, we have the supraspinatus tendon. Deep to it, we have the lovely supraspinatus muscle, and superficial to it, we have a nice piece of muscle as well, and then a thin layer of adipose here. So this patient does not have his does not have any significant atrophy change. They've got really well preserved supraspinatus muscle belly with lovely hypoechoic muscle fibres here, and a reasonable amount of of muscle sitting superficial and deep to that tendon, which is centrally located. So this is a nice example of normal. This, however, is an example of atrophy. So in this case, what we see is we have uh, the trapezius muscle here, we have the supraspinatus tendon in the center, and we have some muscle underneath it. But this other layer that I'm yet to highlight, this one here, this is adipose tissue. So what's really important here is to try and determine whether or not the tissue that is superficial to the tendon is, is muscle fiber or adiposity. And I feel personally that I can do that better in the long axis where you're looking along the fibres of the of the muscle and you can really see that pennate pattern, uh, whereas the adipose just looks like a piece of fat. You can also ask the patient to activate their supraspinatus by doing a resisted abduction and you'll see that uh, the muscle belly will, will tension and tone, where the fat will just sit there and, and won't have any response to that provocation. So that can also assist you to determine whether or not you're looking at adipose or muscle belly. There's one additional thing that you can do when you're assessing the supraspinatus for atrophy change, and that is you can also come around posteriorly and have a look at the infraspinatus muscle belly. When you have a full thickness tear of the supraspinatus muscle that is relatively chronic in nature, uh, because of the fact that the infraspinatus and the supraspinatus are so interdigitated and really, really share an anthesis, um, essentially, when you have a significant supraspinatus tear, it will in some way uh, disrupt the infraspinatus insertion as well. So if it's a chronic tear, when you see the supraspinatus muscle atrophy, when you come around posteriorly, you'll see there's also infraspinatus atrophy. 
Now, this image is taken in the short axis of infraspinatus anteres minor. So my transducer is around on the posterior part of the shoulder, and it's really in a sagittal orientation. So in other words, pointing straight towards the roof. When you do this in a healthy volunteer, you'll see the infraspinatus is about three times as large as teres minor. However, what you notice in this patient is infraspinatus and teres minor are almost exactly the same size. And the second thing that you notice is infraspinatus is very echogenic and teres minor is beautiful and hypoechoic. So in this example, what we're seeing is a significant atrophy change of infraspinatus. Now there's two main causes for this. If it's a young, healthy patient that does not have a rotator cuff uh, tear, then it's usually a deneuralization problem where the suprascapular nerve is not functioning normally. And this may be because of an injury to the nerve through a dislocation or a labral tear that's led to a paralabral cyst that has invaded the suprascapular notch space and displaced the nerve. It can also be due to a brachial plexus neuritis called Parsonage Turner syndrome. And we see this not uncommonly in younger individuals that present with infraspinatus and supraspinatus muscle atrophy concurrently with preservation of teres minor because of course teres minor is motor driven by the axillary nerve not by the suprascapular nerve. So this one simple picture gives us quite a, lot, a nice lot of information. In an older patient, the more common cause for this infraspinatus atrophy is a, is a chronic tear of the supraspinatus where you'll see uh, supraspinatus and infraspinatus atrophy concurrently. And using the techniques that I've shown you in this uh, case of the week presentation, you can work out really quickly what's going on. So I think it's worth looking at all of these muscle bellies, and most of them are pretty straightforward. They get small and they get echogenic. There's nothing difficult about that. However, with the supraspinatus, it's a little more cunning, and you need to really understand that it undergoes this asymmetrical atrophy pattern, and not to consider the triangle of fat as muscle belly. And once you understand that, you will, I think, diagnose muscle atrophy of supraspinatus more commonly, and will bring our results closer to what the MRI findings are, and that gives a more consistent uh, result for the patient, and will lead to better management outcomes outcomes. Happy scanning and bye for now. I hope you enjoyed this case of the week presentation by Bird Ultrasound. If you enjoyed the presentation please visit birdultrasound.com.au where you'll find plenty of other educational material about ultrasound topics and please feel free to email me anytime at stayintouch at birdultrasound.com.au. My name's Stephen Bird, happy scanning and bye for now.